COVID-19 has shown that uh, there is a need to rapidly increase uh, manufacture of uh, vaccines and other products in a pandemic. But this, this is also true for other diseases, in particular to address uh, infectious diseases in developing countries. This, of course, needs to be associated with uh, a multilateral system for an, an equal distribution of the products which are needed. And as we know, neither the expansion of uh, manufacturing capacity has taken place, nor the multilateral scheme in order to ensure equality in the distribution, in particular, of the vaccines. Uh, we are still suffering, in particular, developing countries from, from this situation of the very unequal and unfair distribution of vaccines around the world. So this has happened uh, to a great extent because um, companies that uh, developed the vaccines were not uh, keen to share the technologies. There was, there was no decisive action at the international level in order to expand manufacturing capacity. And this, this despite the fact that in many places in developed and developing countries, there was the capacity to enter into production of vaccines. In some cases, for instance, some plants producing biologicals could be repurposed in order to produce vaccines, but this capacity has not been used. And this is one of the reasons why now a lot of people is suffering because uh, shortage of supply, which is insufficient to uh, provide vaccination to all the population. In May 25 uh, this year, the World Health Assembly adopted a resolution entitled strengthening local production of medicines and other health technologies to improve access. So this is a, a welcome resolution. Uh, let's hope that this may lead to more decisive action at the international level in order to effectively promote an expansion of manufacturing capacity of medicines and other health products around the world in particular. Of course, this is, this is the interest of uh, the South Center in developing countries. And this is necessary in order to transform, to change the, the structure of the industry. So the pharmaceutical industry is a structure around uh, big companies to a great extent, which dominate some of the markets. For instance, in the case of new antibiotics, a few companies which are able to finance uh, research and development actually control the market for these new antibiotics. So this leading to a an oligopoly. In the case of, uh, of vaccines, this has been uh, very well studied in the past before the COVID-19 situation. Uh, a very few uh, number of companies dominated the global mar market for vaccines. In accordance to some studies, 80% of the global sales of vaccines were accounted for, for by just five companies. This was depicted by some as the vaccines production club. So there is a need also to change the industry structure in relation to the production of vaccines. And certainly then the promotion of the uh, local production is the key, the key element, the key tool to achieve that. And in particular, as I mentioned, we are very much interested in this expansion of production in developing countries. So without uh, further delay, I would like now to introduce our first speaker, Anthony So. So thank you very much, Anthony, for joining us and for this association with the South Center to organize this, this event. Anthony So is professor uh, of, uh, and founding director of Innovation Plus Design Enable Access IDEA at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He is also the director of the strategic policy program of REACT, Action on Antibiotic Resistance. So thank you very much, uh, Anthony, uh, for uh, joining us and for cooperating in this in organization of this uh, webinar. The floor is with you. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be with you, Carlos, and everyone else on this <laughs> panel. Focus, uh, this focus on the panel, of course, on the important issue of local production. And thanks to the South Center, as well as the UN High Level Political Forum, for the opportunity to share this overview over how local production might help ensure a sustainable and resilient response to COVID-19 and emerging infectious diseases. So what do we mean by local production? In this context, we refer to the strategic localization of the pharmaceutical value chain. In particular, by locating the value chain in low and middle income countries, we might better achieve key policy aims, many of which have taken on greater urgency during the ongoing pandemic. 
Today, that urgency comes from the need to meet the demand for COVID-19 vaccines, for those who may fall victim to the disease before we can vaccinate them, and to prevent the surge of a deadlier variant, which our current vaccines cannot effectively prevent. This dual imperative should motivate the global community to invest in such efforts. However, it is helpful to unpack the expectations different stakeholders have over the promise of local production. With locating R&D and receiving technology transfer, the hope is that low and middle income countries or LMICs will gain access to the building blocks of knowledge and capacity building for follow-on innovation efforts. By locating pharmaceutical manufacturing of active pharmaceutical ingredients and fill to finish operations, countries hope to gain health security by exercising greater control over what might be produced from these facilities. And with manufacturing, other capacities may follow, including bolstering of the regulatory capacity to ensure that such facilities are quality compliant. And of course, priority in line for procurement, particularly for national needs, but also for other countries regionally or elsewhere. The promise of local production carries expectations that if the manufacture of health technologies could be placed closer to those in need, perhaps the mismatch between supply and demand based on public health priorities would not be so wide. Each of these stages in the pharmaceutical value chain offers opportunities whereby global efforts could make a difference. These expectations are fueled in part by recent decades of experience that conditions of access placed on public financing, such as through product development partnerships for neglected tropical diseases might yield affordable access. That pooling of intellectual property, whether voluntarily through the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool or CTAP, a technology innovation hub, or as a result of the WTO TRIPS waiver, might facilitate technology transfer that enables local manufacturing to proceed. Case in point, in its first decade, the Medicines Patent Pool has worked with 23 generic manufacturers and product developers to sublicense HIV antiretrovirals and hepatitis C treatments, delivering over 18 and a half billion doses of low cost medicines and saving nearly $2 billion in the process. That public sector manufacturing might scale up what the private sector has not been able to deliver from API production to fill and finish that regulation might work towards expanding the collaborative registration procedure to local production. After all, WHO estimates that only 30% of national regulatory agencies have sufficient capabilities to provide oversight of quality assured medical products. So these efforts could help shorten the time to registration and market entry. And that local production might also be accompanied by ensuring effective demand for such products, as well as affordable pricing through pooled procurement regulatory harmonization should be linked to poor pool procurement. So for the promise of local production, which some discuss as if it were just the middle of this value chain, to take place, we must also address the flanking issues on both sides that guide whether the resulting product can be both sustainably and affordably produced. Early in the pandemic, Andrew Hill's group from the University of Liverpool documented the input costs for producing drugs particularly those with potential to treat COVID-19, factoring in margin for formulation and profit and compared these figures against marketed costs. One of the key drivers for bolstering local production is to narrow the sometimes wide gulf between the marginal cost of manufacturing and the price paid for the marketed cost of a product. For hepatitis C drugs, they found that while Gilead had priced a 12 week course, a sofosbuvir, as high as $84,000 in the United States, the marginal cost of production could conceivably be as low as $68 to $136. Over time, the company would make the same drug available for $900 and then later $300 for treatment course in countries like Egypt. The latest challenge for tiered pricing is over Gilead's preferential price for 116 low and middle income countries for liposomal amphotericin B, struck late in 2018, but not yet covering the indication of black fungus due to COVID-19. In the meantime, the price per vial in India is reportedly up to four times this preferential tiered price. Tiered pricing has typically required the volunteer commitment of the manufacturer. Local production with public financing could, provided the right access conditions, work to narrow this gulf between production cost and marketed price. By 2008, 80% of all donor funded purchases of ARVs for HIV AIDS were being supplied by Indian manufacturers and similarly, developing country vaccine manufacturers produce a significant share of older children's vaccines. However, the picture for new vaccines has been less promising. 
availability, even more so than affordability, being a barrier for COVID-19 vaccines. And we need a new pathway to achieving health equity. The disparity that motivates today's renewed look at local production clearly stems from the vast inequities between how high and upper and middle income countries have reserved and administered COVID-19 vaccines while much of the world has been left behind. As the graph on the right shows, over 85% of the vaccine doses administered have gone to those in high income and upper middle income countries, whereas fewer than 15% of those doses have gone to the poorest half of the world's population. BRICS countries such as Russia, China, and India have played a prominent role in bringing forward vaccine candidates, but demand still exceeds supply by large measure. However, is this the kind of local production the global health community seeks? Have most of these vaccine doses flowed to lower income countries, not just to meet domestic priority or have been made available through the COVAX facility? Have they been better priced than their high income country counterparts? The Serum Institute of India's vaccine stands out at the lower end of pricing, while China's anchors the upper end, even at prices that exceed those of Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna's mRNA vaccines. Does public funding upfront for R&D result in better vaccine pricing for the public? Well, according to UNICEF's dashboard, Moderna's vaccine average dose price exceeds Pfizer BioNTech's by $10 per dose or $20 per course. That is despite significant upfront public funding to Moderna from the US government, illustrating how ensuring fairer returns to the public on pricing requires better negotiated access conditions with government financing. Yet COVID-19 is not the typical vaccine market. It has a market of unprecedented size, financing on a global scale, and potential manufacturers with candidates in the R are many manufacturers, potential manufacturers with candidates in the R&D pipeline. In scaling up local production, drugs and vaccines, not to mention diagnostics, may follow quite different paths. The near universal demand for COVID-19 vaccines is a different market than, say, for the hundreds of orphan diseases, second line drugs for multi-drug resistant TB or antibiotics where effective stewardship may be required. For those potentially smaller markets, let's consider what level of sales might be needed to draw in private sector investment. Sales revenue would need to cover what's not already subsidized in part or whole, such as the cost of production, R&D costs, administrative costs, and a profit margin. On this graph, we just do the math based on whether the company doing local production expects annual sales of 200 million in blue, 400 million in red, or 800 million in green. Working our way up from the smallest markets, we can calculate the average treatment price needed to achieve these expectations. For the very rare diseases, up to 20,000 patients treated, the price per treatment course would range between 10 to $40,000 per patient. This is the size of the US market, or carbapenem resistant acinobacter or enterobacteriaceae. For an orphan disease market, up to 200,000 patients, it would range from $1,000 to $4,000. This is the size of the US market for SDL producing enterobacteriaceae and drug resistant salmonella. And finally, for the market up to 900,000 cases per year, as in strep pneumonia and gonorrhea, we come down to just hundreds of dollars in the price for treating each patient. So right-sizing the expectations for what local producers might anticipate in returns on investment, public or private, will be key. These challenges for local production are not new. A couple decades ago, Amy Batson and Peter Evans came up with this visualization, later adapted here, into zones where WHO and UNICEF might prioritize their targeting strategy for scaling and ensuring sustainable vaccine supply, many of which were children's vaccines at that time. The horizontal x-axis captures the size of the country's population, and the vertical y-axis captures GNP per capita. So the bigger the population and the greater the economic wealth of the country, the less likely it would require support. The impl implication was that local vaccine production might scale more sustainably in a country whose internal market size was big enough to give it economies of scale, and or whose economic wealth could also enable it to buy security. Today's discussions are motivated by how to ensure local production that might serve those countries, particularly in the A and B zones of this graphic, that might need financial support, at least in the near term. So we reconstructed the Bass and Evans grid to revisit where vaccine manufacturing might be cited using, again, the axes of population and GNI per capita. For a quick look, 
we identified those countries that are home to COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers listed on UNICEF's dashboard with contracts. These countries are represented in blue dots, not surprisingly largely in the upper right-hand quadrant, where countries have larger populations and or greater wealth as measured by GNI per capita. Superimposing the World Bank's classification of countries, we see that most of these countries are upper middle income and high income countries with noticeable exceptions. While Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna brought the first mRNA vaccines to market, we might zoom in on countries that are home to developers with mRNA vaccine candidates on the way. We have circled these in red. Among them, five LMICs, China, India, Thailand, Russia, and Brazil, already have mRNA vaccine candidates in clinical testing, and another three LMICs have candidates in preclinical development, Iran, Turkey, and Bangladesh. In total, on the UNICEF dashboard, there are at least 18 mRNA vaccine candidates moving forward, six in clinical development, and 12 in preclinical phases. Just a couple of weeks ago, the WHO and its partners in COVAX announced their support of the first COVID mRNA vaccine technology transfer hub in collaboration with the South African Consortium of Companies, Universities, and the Africa CDC. These developments could contribute to the promise of local production. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing renewed interest in regional collective action to support the local production, whether it's in UNCTAD's continued work to consider local and regional production of antibiotics in East Africa, or the work underway by the African Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative, which we should be hearing about shortly. At the global level, the difficulties facing the COVAX facility over the past year are an illustration of collective action challenges where short-term interests of individual actors come into conflict with long-term collective interests. Clearly, we have fallen short as a global community in responding with equity to this pandemic. But can we build a more robust foundation for regional collective action through local production? For health technologies, we seek to make them available as public goods. Pure public goods are defined in economic terms as non-excludable and non-rivalrous, but we have to manage both axes. We can help create the enabling environment to make excludable goods non-excludable through the pooling of building blocks of knowledge, such as through the WTO TRIPS waiver or CTAP, creating technology innovation hubs, or leveraging the buying power of the public sector through pooled procurement. We can also make these goods less scarce, less rivalrous if we scale production. But to share these equitably, we will need to act as if our collective interests are at stake. Might we be inspired by some of the principles that Eleanor Ostrom, the late Nobel Prize winning economist, put forward in managing common pool goods? These typically refer to natural or constructed system of resources. But some of the principles she laid out, clear boundaries of users and resource, congruence between benefits and costs, regular monitoring of users and resource conditions, the transparency we still lack in the priority setting of the queues for produced vaccines, Graduated sanctions and conflict resolution mechanisms seem to resonate here as well. How do we divide how production is staged among countries in a region? Use regional or global pooled procurement to guarantee the sustainability of national production in one country, but also its access across countries in times of need. What is the system's thinking behind the architecture of interdependency that will sustain these efforts at the regional level. Just as the pharmaceutical value chain suggested at the start of this presentation, we need an end-to-end -end approach to bringing health technologies to market, one that coordinates efforts that flank local production from R&D to procurement. Some of the institutional arrangements we're now discussing are the key elements of such an approach. In closing, I remind us that as daunting as today's challenge is, in some ways, we have been here before. Over a decade after Fleming's discovery of penicillin, encountering slow progress in Britain to produce penicillin, Howard Florey came to the United States where the Government Office of Scientific Research and Development and his Committee on Medical Research assisted in the development of penicillin. The government's Committee on Medical Research helped in several key ways. First, it introduced Florey to the US Department of Agriculture Research Lab that was looking for an economic use of corn steep liquor, which happened to be the ideal culture medium for penicillin. Second, to scale up production, 
the Committee on Medical Research got appropriate waivers to overcome industry concerns of antitrust if firms cooperated in developing the drug. And third, to offset the risk that firms investing in the production of natural penicillin would lose their monopoly, the government subsidized its production to the tune of $75 million, a huge sum at that time. Pfizer, then a small firm, possessed the critical process, the innovation of submerged fermentation that enabled the scale up of penicillin production. And in 1941, Pfizer would enter into agreement with Merck and Squibb that included full exchange of research and production information for this project. Of note, Merck would then have access to technology useful for his own subsequent work on streptomycin. On a war footing at that time, scale up was rapid. By 1944, 21 firms were producing penicillin. The results within a decade were the penicillin production as a generic drug by multiple firms multiplied over 70 fold and the price fell from $200 per million Oxford units to 50 cents. But there is another chapter, one detailed some years ago of India's Prime Minister Nehru's decision to accept a UNICEF WHO proposal and grant to help build a manufacturing facility for penicillin over overtures by Pfizer, Glaxo and Merck at the time. Nehru did so recognizing the importance that such capacity had to be owned and grown unlike building a, a bridge or dam. For their part, UNICEF and WHO envisioned developing an antibiotic R&D training center tied to the facility and sharing technical know-how developed there as part of a global network of such centers. Though there was some delay in the first year of operations, penicillin production came online and exceeded its original target. It is fitting that this agreement was signed exactly 70 years ago this month in July 1951. Perhaps some history is worth repeating. Thank you for the opportunity of providing these opening reflections. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony, for uh, such a brilliant presentation as, as usual. You have provided a lot of information and framework for analysis and this fascinating case about penicillin that, that's re re really very interesting. Uh, still, penicillin accounts for a large part of the sales of antibiotics, about 20%. So this is a very interesting case. So thank you very much. There will be an opportunity later on to uh, respond to questions that will be managed through the question and answer function in the system. So we, we need to receive your questions from the participants in a written form. So thank you very much, Anthony, for this uh, very, very nice opening of the discussion. So we move now uh, without further delay to our next uh, speaker panelist. This is Ayoade Alakija. Dr. Alakija is currently the co-chair of the African Union Africa Vaccine Delivery Alliance for COVID-19. So it's a very important position. She also serves on the Global Advisory Board of Women Lift Health. She is the chief strategist of Convince Africa. And she's also the former chief humanitarian coordinator for the government of Nigeria. And she led the joint national and international humanitarian response in the Lake Chad region between 2016 and 2019. So thank you very much, Azuade, for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Carlos. I, I have to say that Anthony's presentation was brilliant. And quite frankly, he renders the rest of us almost, um, almost needless because he has laid out the, the situation so clearly. My remarks will be brief, um, and I, I look forward to a re robust discussion afterwards. As I said, you know, we have heard all of this over and over again with regards to what is needed in this current pandemic for vaccine equity. How are we going to end this pandemic anywhere in the world and how these variants are not going to come back and haunt us? And yes, it is very complex. Anthony said, and I agree, that we have fallen short. And we must acknowledge, I want to start with a global picture before I go to my continent. And we must acknowledge that the global health infrastructure as we know it has not necessarily delivered for any of us in this pandemic. And that I think is one of our starting points. I love what Anthony just did with the history and telling us what happened you know, between 1929 when penicillin was first discovered and 1955 when we saw mass production of it in India, which of course is a low middle income country considered today. And that is in many respects what we're, we're talking about. We're talking about localization of production of, of vaccines and medicines um, across the, 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 the entire world. The, the, 
the post-World War system, I think, you know, it's interesting that he used those years because there was a commitment and there was a, a, a camaraderie, a, a, a global cooperation, I think, at that time that we seem to be missing, missing now. You know, we're more in the vaccine nationalism stage. And indeed, we cannot get vaccines to other parts of, to, to parts of the world unless there is local production. I'm going to move away from Africa very briefly and go to the Pacific region, where I think we have seen a brilliant example of what we're trying to talk about today. You know, the, the, the island nation of Fiji is suffering right now from one of the worst surges per capita of COVID in the entire world. I think their numbers today, they recorded 636 cases in one day, 24 hours, in a country of less than 900 million people. That is a 900,000, sorry, people. That is a severe, severe outbreak in Fiji. And yet what has prevented the deaths has been, or mass deaths so far, has been local regional production, has been the fact that the AstraZeneca vaccine that has been produced in Australia is being flown in, in a tri trickle amounts, no doubt, 20,000 this week, 30,000 next week, but they're receiving vaccines as quickly as Australia can get the vaccines to them. And therefore they are vaccinating people and desperately trying to vaccinate their way out of this crisis. That for me is the perfect example of why we need local regional production of vaccines. The global situation has impacted them at the beginning. They only received 12,000 through COVAX, 12,000 doses through COVAX from the um, Serum Institute, but then they went to their regional neighbor and the, the, the regional production capacity has been able to stop the, the, the not the, of course, because of the variants, not the infections, but at least we're not seeing huge deaths, not yet. So let us use that as a, as a basis. And yet it is incredibly complex. You know, local production, we're going to hear soon, I hope, from Patrick, I think he's now on, you know, about the, the vaccine manufacturing initiative in, in, in Africa. Or also, you know, a few months ago, I have been involved through you know, both in my personal capacity with, um, with, with, with chairing meetings for the ACT Accelerator in terms of vaccine production, and also in my sort of, the, the other hat that I wear, I, I mean, I'm here in my own personal capacity today, but in the other hat that I wear with the Africa Vaccine Delivery Alliance, we have looked at how we can ensure greater vaccine manufacturing. And that was referred to in the, in the opening by by Anthony, where you talked about the, this new collaboration with South Africa, and I'll leave that for other people to talk about. But we need to put those blocks, building blocks in place now. You know, we, we talk about R&D, we talk about technology transfer, but what is complex about this is that, for instance, the value chain, that the product, product supply chain for production of vaccines is another issue that we need to speak about very, very concretely. It is not just that you, 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 tech, you, just, you, you transfer technology and then boom, you know, and do some capacity building and you can create vaccines. No, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine alone contains 180 components that are manufactured at 867 sites in 12 countries around the world. How do we begin to build the capacity within places like Africa, Latin America, other parts of the world, even prior to us having the permissions, you know, the WTO tech, um, um, trips waiver, et cetera. How do we begin to plan for that now? Let us look at practical actions. The Pfizer mRNA vaccine contains 280 components produced at 86 sites in 19 countries. These are the realities and the practicalities around these very technical discussions that we may be having. We're, we're also, to, to, to some extent, I think at the beginning of this pandemic, from, 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 from my perspective, ignored the fact that it is not just, you know, we, we see these health issues as a, as, you know, just like we did in the early on in the days of HIV AIDS, as a health problem. And we attacked it from the WHA perspective, from the health perspective. But this is a multi-sectoral issue. And one of the reasons I think we, you know, we have to stop talking to each other, to ourselves, to the ones who understand. We need to start talking to ministers of finance, for instance, and bringing both ministers of finance and ministers of health into the room to determine how, and also ministers of trade and investment, to determine how vaccine production within our countries, say in Africa, becomes not just a good for, 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 for us, but becomes a global good for the world and also is good business. 
You know, we're seeing now what is happening with the Serum Institute of India in, in terms of them and India also, you know, with that interesting history we just saw becoming the pharmacy for the world. You know, Africa has tried to procure vaccines. Individual countries, small countries in Africa, fought to even the bigger countries, let me use Nigeria as an example, my country, Nigeria, at the very beginning, tried to secure procurement contracts for vaccines for the high income countries had bought them all. You know, we all know this story. We know that, that all the places in the queue were taken up by high income countries. And then th th there, was a, there was a move towards sort of pooling our resources, pooling our collective bargaining power, as it were, for, for regional and, and, and more group procurement. But even that we have seen that the, the, the G7 countries, the G20 countries need to push forward to, to, to help in this, re, in this regard. But in the immediate term, we need to share more doses of vaccines for sure for Africa and for other parts of the world, Latin America, Peru and countries that are seeing horrendous surges right now. But in the, in the medium to long term, local vaccine production is the only way, as I gave the example earlier, to end this to, to, to end this inequity that we're, we're facing all over the world. And there, there are those who will talk about profits and talk about, you know, pharma and profits, but this is not a time for profits. This is a time for humanity. This is a time to save lives. And it is my hope as I end my intervention, looking very carefully at, at Carlos, who's watching the clock, you know, as I end my intervention, it is my hope that this robust discussion that we're going to have today will, will, will go some way as we talk to member states and, 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 and begin to look at evaluating, for instance, the ACT Accelerator. Let's have an in, independent evaluation of the ACT Accelerator and the COVAX mechanism and see how in future we can make these things more inclusive so that they indeed serve all of the people that they're meant to serve and not, and not leaving the majority of the world behind. Over. Thank you, Carlos. Well, thank you, Ajwade, for this uh, excellent presentation as well. Thank you for very insightful comments you have made. Let me just uh, highlight some of them. In the first place, you clearly indicated the lack of uh, the global cooperation was missing in this, uh, this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, it was proclaimed, but it was not practiced. And I think this is, this is the drama that we are living now, in particular in developing countries. Secondly, you, you mentioned, uh, this is very appropriate, the fact that in order to produce a vaccine, you need a large number of components. And many of these components are subject to intellectual property rights. That's, this is one of the reasons why the waiver, which is now under negotiation in the, the Council for Trips, is very important because it would be almost impossible for a company to negotiate all the voluntary licenses that are needed in order to, to produce and assemble a vaccine. And this is one of the very reasons why the European Union proposal doesn't, doesn't seem to be constructive at all because it's, it's just trying to use this system of compulsory license, which is very important, but which uh, may not work in a situation like this. So I think the point you made is, is, is very important as well. Also, the fact that this is not just a health problem, it's a problem that is uh, multi-sectoral, and this would include uh, production ministries and the finance ministries in order to see how a solution can be given to this through the expansion of the local production, as you have argued quite strongly. And also, uh, I think it's, uh, it's something to be highlighted, the, uh, the need for an evaluation, an independent evaluation of the way in which the ACT Accelerator has operated, in particular the COVAX facility, as we know, has not been able to uh, fulfill the mandate or the objectives it had in terms of distributing 2 billion doses for uh, developing countries, low income countries in particular, by the end of this year. It's really far from, from doing that. So it's really needed to, uh, to look at this. COVAX, in fact, entered into competition, as you suggested, with other governments desperate to get uh, vaccines, so competing against each other. So it was not a real multilateral solution to the problem. And, and then there is a need to improve this. And let's hope that this will come out of uh, future negotiations or discussions in the context of the World Health Organization. So thank you very much, Andrade, for your contribution. So now we'll move to Patrick. Patrick Tipo, are you there? Oh, okay, Patrick, well, I'm, I'm glad yes. that you, yeah, you were able to join us. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, participating also in this uh, event and let me just make a very brief introduction of your very rich CV. 
Patrick is the executive director of the African Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative. So it's a very important role and we respect your, your views and on, on what is going on in this respect. He is also the head of science and innovation at BioVac uh, in South Africa. And he's currently serves as vice president of developing countries vaccine manufacturers network, which also uh, we really want to learn more about the role that this uh, network can play in expanding the manufacturing capacity for vaccine. So Patrick, thanks very much again. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope that you can see my presentation. Yeah, that's correct. Yes, we can see that. Excellent. I'm going to try to put it on slideshow. There we go. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, it's really a privilege to uh, be sharing the platform uh, with so many capable and experienced speakers. And uh, I hope that I can make a contribution from an African vaccine manufacturing perspective. <clears throat> so a little bit about the AVMI, the African Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative. As the name suggests, we are very passionate about doing whatever we can do to advance the establishment of sustainable human vaccine manufacturing capacity on the, on the African continent. And we were established uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, we are an entirely voluntary organization, but uh, we have invested our time and energies and expertise in driving this mission forward. And I think that it's without a doubt uh, coming to full focus now the importance of having local vaccine manufacturing capacity. This is a very high level sweep of a number of issues that I'd like to cover in the next uh, few minutes. Um, through this slide, I have attempted to simplify the story that if you don't have vaccine manufacture, you're going to have to go out with a begging bowl uh, in order to get access uh, for vaccines. And we see, uh, we've seen that unfold in a very, very uh, um, black and white way um, with COVID-19. Simply put, the, the easiest way to guarantee access is through making the product yourself. Furthermore, I think it's also important to realize that while driving this conversation and all efforts to argue for the need for local vaccine manufacturing capacity, we should not uh, forget about the sustainability of something after having established it. And this is, this is important. And so we can't build something simply for a pandemic because how do we keep this thing going between pandemics? And a key issue which we need to address on the African continent are the procurement channels, the way they are currently uh, positioned, and also the way the markets are shaped in Africa, given that um, 40 or so of the 55 African countries depend exclusively or partially on UNICEF, supported by Gavi, for their vaccines. So this is an important issue to contend with in terms of incentivizing and stimulating local vaccine production on the continent. Just a quick overview that uh, we have in the order of five active manufacturing entities on the continent. So we don't have to scratch, start, from, start from scratch. Biovac in South Africa, and by the way, for full transparency, my day job is with BioVac, based in Cape Town, South Africa. Innovative Biotech in Nigeria, Institute Pasteur de Car in Senegal, Institute Pasteur uh, Tunis in Tunisia, and Vaxira in, in Egypt. And then there have been a, no a number of other countries and companies who are, have plans or who are busy developing plans uh, aimed at building capacity um, over the next few years. Ghana, Morocco, Ethiopia, uh, biovaccines in Nigeria, biomedical labs trying to set up in Mauritius, and there are a few more that, uh, that we learn of uh, with each passing day. The sad reality that this slide uh, um, aims to demonstrate is that we knew this, what the situation was 10 years ago. In 2011, 
This was a slide taken from WHO. In 2011, we saw that we had an issue with respect to influenza vaccine manufacturing capacity. And again, focusing on Africa, there was absolutely no capacity then. And sadly, in 2021, there is still no capacity for uh, influenza vaccine production. And this, by and large, mirrors the situation that we're in with the COVID-19 uh, disease. This is a slide that I actually put together last year sometime. I've not changed it at all, but the story is still the same. We are all too familiar with the story. I, um, I had the privilege of participating in uh, a virtual conference on expanding Africa's vaccine manufacturing capacity which was coordinated by the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in early April, 2021, uh, under the leadership of uh, Dr. John and Kengerson. And I must say that in my opinion, this was a groundbreaking uh, conference. And uh, I'm encouraged, by, not only by what happened at the conference, but the plans and the efforts that are currently unfolding with respect to driving this agenda forward of building capacity on the continent of Africa. There were two major outcomes to this meeting. The launching of a, uh, of a partnership called the Partnership for African Vaccine Manufacturing, and then uh, the establishment of a framework for action with milestones. So uh, this conference sought to uh, uh, demonstrate that it was not going to be a talk shop. Um, this is the vision that arose out of that conference uh, for vaccine manufacturing in Africa to ensure Africa has timely access to vaccines to protect public health security by establishing a sustainable vaccine development and manufacturing ecosystem. And I want to emphasize the fact that we not only and should not only be fact, uh, focusing on manufacturing but development is important as well. And I will argue the case shortly. What we are talking about when we talk about vaccine manufacture, we're talking about full value chain vaccine manufacture, end to end vaccine manufacture, from start to finish, not just simply formulation and filling or packaging and labeling. And this is key in terms of building the capability that will deliver a greater degree of, of health security and national security into the future. So why is vaccine R&D important? Why is the development component of this important, uh, uh, of vaccines important? If you don't, well, let me first say that these black arrows indicate the entry points for technology transfers to take place. So either it's from the full value chain or further downstream in filling and freeze drying, or formulation and freeze drying. And I think that uh, technology transfers are very important, but without R&D capacity, the development of the scientific know-how, the uh, ability to absorb technology transfers becomes very compromised. So that's one of the reasons. The second reason why vaccine R&D is important is that if one doesn't develop one's own product, then there's going to be an exclusive dependence on partners to provide you with the technology. And we've seen that run into, into huge uh, challenges and trouble with uh, COVID-19 vaccine technology access. So we know this picture too well. 99% of vaccines are imported. Uh, a bold goal has been, has been uh, established where uh, uh, we're aiming towards uh, producing 60% of what we consume in Africa uh, in 2040. It's a bold goal, but uh, I think it is, uh, it is necessary for us to aim high. The, the, this partnership is, is framed uh, with respect to specific focus areas. There's the whole coordination and agenda setting, uh, the concept of establishing regional hubs, mobilizing resources, financing, uh, strengthening of regulatory capacity, and uh, the importance of technology transfer and workforce development, skills development. 
And um, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but there's a breakdown of the kinds of products that we should be focused on. Obviously, COVID-19. Um, secondly, we need to focus on Afri uh, African-specific pathogens. Uh, we also need to think globally and not just a made in Africa for Africa, but Africa being in a position to make a contribution to the global supply chain as well when it comes to vaccine. And fourthly, and very importantly, not forgetting routine immunization, vaccines required for routine immunization, because this is the foundation of the business case with respect to uh, uh, vaccine production and sustainability. To end, I have just highlighted a few recent developments that are of significance in my opinion. We've heard about the mRNA vaccine technology hub in Africa, uh, established in South Africa that BioVac and Afrigen and a few universities are part of. There's been a donation from the German government to, uh, uh, to Senegal for building capacity. We've seen Egypt announce their partnership with a Chinese company for the production of a COVID-19 vaccine. We know about the success story that Aspen is in South Africa capable of producing a few million doses of, uh, well, a couple of hundred million doses of the J&J vaccine, so that partnership. And then uh, lastly, Biovax partnership with a company called Immunity Bio in the US um, which is still under clinical trials uh, with their COVID product. Um, and then obviously Biovax uh, uh, plans for, for expansion as well. So I thought I'll, I'll touch on just a few things. I know that time is short, that this has been a high level overview and I'm hoping that during the, the discussion and the Q and A, we, we will have an opportunity to dive into more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick, for this presentation. Uh, we we'll certainly applaud uh, Africa and the African Union for the efforts it's, it's making in order to dramatically change this, the over-dependency of Africa in terms of the production of vaccines. I think this is something that needs to be highlighted very much. And we, in the South Center, we are really very, very happy with this initiative that has been now materialized in, in, in Africa. So thank you for making reference to uh, the new partnership for African vaccine manufacturing. As you said, the objective may seem to be ambitious, but it is feasible to get that if the conditions are met. So uh, as you said, it is not possible to repeat the, the experience with influenza vaccines, the failed experience with influenza vaccines. This should be done. And I also like to emphasize that you mentioned that both development and manufacturing vaccines are at play, it's not just the manufacturing or fill and finish, which is what some, uh, some institutions are doing now in, in, in developing countries, but to control the, the whole process from uh, development of the vaccine up to the manufacturing, development of the raw materials, and then uh, fill and finish. So this is very important. You did mention the absorption capacity as one uh, important component, I fully agree with would agree with that, but uh, sometimes the current lack of absorption capacity is used by some to argue that it is not possible to expand production of vaccines in developing countries. But certainly this is not the case. You can develop such absorption capacity. And in many cases, it may not take as long as some people may, may think. So absorption capacity must be there, but the, the current lack of it should not be an excuse. To, uh, to retain technologies, not to sell technologies, has been the case so far. And we, we have seen this uh, in part because on the basis of the, the setup failure in order to actually function as a pool of technology. So thank you very much for this presentation. I'm sure there will be many questions about uh, what could be the future of Africa in becoming a major producer of vaccines, not only for African needs, but also, as you said, for the rest of the world. Uh, so now I, I move to our next uh, distinguished uh, panelist, uh, Akira Homa. Akira? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So Akira, Akira has been director of the Bio Marginius, Fiocruz, a very important institution working in this area in Brazil for 22 years. And he has been the president of Fiocruz and also the Developing Countries Vaccine Manufacturing Network. 
which, uh, as I mentioned, I'd like to know more what this, what the role of this network can be in order to expand local production of vaccines. So, Akira, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, President Carlos Correa. So it is a, a very pleasure to come and speak to this uh, event and the experience of biomanguinhos no? in this local production. Next slide, please. Next. So, uh, of course, uh, this is only to stress uh, that uh, uh, all countries, but particularly on the poorest developing countries not prepared and highly dependent on importation of hospital and laboratory equipment supply, input of vaccine production, vaccines and so on, impacts very highly. So, and it, uh, we had a discrepant policy among the countries for SARS-CoV containment. Resection of mass protection, lockdown in several countries results in overall the hospital, many collapses. Vaccine and vaccination is, are the hope and the very high expectation there. Hello, uh, next, please. Uh, and the vaccination advances globally. More than 3 billion doses applied. 42 billion, million doses applied daily in 180 countries. However, the high income countries are getting 30 times faster than low income developing countries. 75% of vaccination is in the high developing countries. Only 0.9% of vaccination is in low income countries need to increase the world's capacity for vaccine production. No? But it is very important to remember that and highlight that the government of high developed countries have made enormous investment in research, technology development and the production of COVID vaccine in uh, 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 COVID vaccine as uh, BARDA, Operation Warp Speed, CEPI, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, and many others. So billions of dollars was invested in very short times. We never had such a big investment in development of vaccine. And uh, they used it, it was used the fast track procedures no? uh, to, to get in very short time a vaccine, less than one year, a shot, it was uh, one shot of a vaccine started to be applied there in the United Kingdom. And of course, the intellectual property, technology, production, patents, patents, uh, and production are concentrated in few high development countries. Next, please. Local, local production, local vaccine production is, however, a long time expectation. You know, back there in 19s, at the PAHO WHO, we discussed the Sireva project in the region of uh, South America region. We had uh, globally a children vaccine initiative. Uh, the UNDP also was involved and in, uh, organized the IVI there in South Korea. International Vaccine Institute. No, Gavi was created in 2000. The CVMN was created in 2000. Uh, uh, you know, all uh, with the motivation, looking for uh, uh, access to vaccine to everybody and the production also. And we had also at the World Health Assembly in 2008, uh, discussing local production, tech transfer, biotechnology capacity, and improving the access in, locally. And 2018 also, World Health Assembly also discussed the, the importance of local production to overcome shortages and access medicaments and vaccine. 
In 19, uh, 2019, the interagency meeting, no, David Cho, UNICEF, uh, uh, UNICEF, AIDS, uh, UNIDO, Global Fund, UNCTAD, local, and discuss local production of medicine, uh, of medicine and vaccines. And this current year, we had also World Health Assembly uh, reiterate and reinforcing the importance of local production of medicaments, uh, of vaccine, and also they discussed the waiver of patents. No? And it, in uh, last month, we had uh, uh, the World Summit for Local Vaccine Production uh, uh, organized by David Cho there in Ethiopia. Next. Uh, the challenge, however, we had already Patrick and the others saying some challenge of there. So it will be easy for me to explain this. The production activity are very complex, multi steps, multiple steps, each require specific needs. It's very important to have a general view, no? And the enforcement of all good practices, GMP, uh, uh, GKG, uh, good quality practices, good clinical practices, good laboratory practice, biosafety, and the others. No? And important also to remember that all inputs must be of high quality, certified for one product, one product, more or less, it is, uh, it will require three, 300 different uh, inputs. And most of them in our region, most of them are imported, you know? Uh, I, uh, so this is a very important issue. The industrial scale of production, you know, must be there. Uh, and have also much product in order to reduce cost of production. And we need to have a third generation technology, especially if we talk about COVID-19 vaccine, you know, and technology transfer. Uh, uh, to build, uh, to, in order to build a facility and start production, uh, it takes at least four or five years if you have a, a strong support to do that, you know, strong commitment, strong uh, financing there in the place. Uh, and uh, in four or five years, uh, if the current pandemic is controlled, there will be excess of vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, but we must prepare for the next epidemic. Uh, so, and requires uh, another important issue, requires expert qualified human resource, qualified human resource, which is very scarce, very rare in our region for management, production, operation, quality control, administration, and it needs a strong technical management coordination and governance. A huge amount of investment is required. Next, please. So, yeah, the challenge continuing, definition of the technology, the platform for COVID vaccine and the other vaccine. Uh, uh, the sustainable long-term operation. Uh, this is uh, very important to consider. The economic feasibility, technological capacity, competitiveness, uh, market, local, regional, world supply and pool procurement. He was already put there. Long-term financing sustained by government. I think this is another issue which, which must be considered. Linked, linked with the national immunization program. Uh, I, uh, you know, it is very important to have this link and the strong epidemiological surveillance and the regulatory authority in the region. No? Support of science, technology, and innovation need government political decision. This is uh, uh, essential issue, the political decision of the government. Of, next, please. It, especially if it is regional, you know. Let me talk about the local production, the Brazilian experience. You know, we have a, 
uh, the uh, biological production already back there in 1900, you know, uh, Federal Therapeutic Institute and the Butantan Institute was created there 120 years ago. Uh, and smallpox eradication was used uh, locally produced vaccine. In 1985, in Brazil, in Brazil, we had the Ministry of Health launch the National Self-Sufficient Program for Immune Biologicals and supported it uh, with uh, $100 million during 10 years in order to modernize the existing public laboratories. In the late 20th century, we had elimination of poliomyelitis in Brazil, elimination of poliomyelitis, measles, rubella, using local finished products. No? The continuing the government support to strengthen local, local vaccine production using the government purchase power to incorporate new technology was the key for us. Next, please. So this is just to show the Brazilian public vaccine market we have today. Uh, 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 we use uh, around 285 million doses and 80%, 80% of vaccine is locally produced. Only 20% 20, 20 of vaccine are imported, uh, are imported by inter international manufacturers. And we have already a local production of COVID vaccine. No, Biomagin, our institute, has an agreement with the AstraZeneca Oxford and uh, are making the final step of production using the uh, active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient imported and the Butantan Institute together on an agreement with Sinovac, Sinovac and uh, we both, we both have a uh, expectation to produce a 300 million doses uh, for current year and the next year. Next. See, and just to show that we have a, a long experience with the partnership, international partnership. You know, uh, back there, we had a, a 1937 an incorporation of yellow fever vaccine uh, vaccine production, and later then uh, so many different uh, uh, partnership in order to have a, a different vaccine. For example, with Japan, we had a measles and poliomyelite technology of production, and the uh, uh, former Schmidt Klein today uh, GSK, we had a, a morphine influenza and so on, and so on. You can see. Uh, so many different partnerships we have established. Next, please. Uh, yes, uh, Biomanguinhos, current year, current year is going to supply nine, uh, almost 100 million do doses of uh, different vaccine and uh, already supplied 65 million doses of COVID vaccine. Next. So, we have here, i just show you the campus of Biomagin, today's campus, which is already uh, uh, very small for us. It's not enough uh, to, to incorporate new, new production. Next. So Do, we have- Dr. Roma, Dr. Roma, sorry. Can you yes, please we, wrap up? Yeah, because we are- You are not- time, Yeah. I have two, sli two slides. Okay. Here's the next yeah. campus in order to expand the production capacity. Next, please. Next. So the key message I have is it is very important to have a local production, of course. Not must be sustainable. And public public private partnership is essential. Uh, and in to uh, third generation technology production. Country's political decision and strategic plan is key. No? The strong coordination group of qualified professionals. No? And the, of course, we have a very important problem with the equity, mm -hmm. equity and uh, that we must have uh, as soon as possible the access for vaccine uh, and the uh, 
G7, G20, World Trade Organization must support local production. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Homa, for your presentation. Uh, thank you for reminding us the unequal vaccination rate in develop and developing countries. We all know about this, and of course, we are very much concerned. Thank you also for reminding the very important role that government have uh, played in uh, funding vaccine developments uh, in the case of COVID-19, which, um, which indicates that there, there isn't such a market failure, which is the very justification for intellectual property. There, there isn't such a market failure in the context of COVID-19. And this is why, one, one of the reasons why the waiver, which is being negotiated in the context of the weight organization is important and, uh, and, and will not prevent any further innovation in this field, which has already been funded. Also, also uh, thank you for mentioning and uh, reiterating the importance of the political decision in order to move forward in the local manufacturing. And in fact, Brazil provides an excellent example of developing country, which has been able to reach uh, these objectives of local manufacturing. You have said almost 80% of the vaccines which are uh, consumed in the country are produced locally. So it's an excellent example. This shows that this is feasible. You did indicate that there is a need of significant investment in order to um, develop and produce vaccines, but this is within the reach of many countries, in particular at the regional level, it was uh, mentioned before uh, for the case of Africa. So thank you very much for showing this and in particular how a developing country can actually make it possible to develop a major producer of vaccines, um, not only in order to uh, supply the domestic market, but as you said, also economies of scale are important, but supply other, other markets. Indeed. So thank you very much for this. So we move now to the our first uh, respondent, Analia Porras. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for joining us, Analia. Um, Analia is the unit chief of medicines and health technologies unit at PAHO. In Washington, she leads the team responsible for providing technical cooperation to Latin American countries and the Caribbean countries um, in order to improve equitable access to quality, safe, and uh, medicines and other health technologies. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me to the very stimulating discussion. Um, I think uh, a lot has been said, but just to reiterate a few concepts, COVID has revealed a high dependency, and let me talk from the Latin American perspective, from Latin American Caribbean countries on the import of health technologies from outside our region. Uh, it also put uh, light on the vulnerability of the supply chains during emergencies and the high degree of geographical concentration in COVID-19 vaccine research development and production. The CLAC estimated that, that only 4% of Latin America's imports originated from the region at the initial response for the pandemic for critical health technologies that were used during the pandemic response. So Pajuani Member States have now advanced a policy document on increasing production capacity for essential medicines and health technologies. Similar to the one adopted by the World Health Assembly, the document proposes a series of lines of actions to foster local production, to improve the resilience of health systems during emergencies and to contribute to economic development and access to health products in our region. So it's local production the solution to the access issues that we have in the region. In the document, we reflect part of the experience that we have and the lesson learned from the technical cooperation and working with countries for many years in improved access to health technologies, not only during emergency, but also what we call the peacetime. As Anthony nicely uh, frame it for us, we need to look at the end-to-end -end cycle, as like we like to say, uh, the life cycle of the product. Low and middle income countries face ongoing lack of availability and or affordability of health technologies, which only deepens during health emergencies, but that uh, precedes and will persist after the health emergency is gone. 
Health technologies manufacturers is, as we know, very concentrating in only a few countries. The pandemic revealed the vulnerability of the international supply chains and that manufacturing countries, regardless of their income level, did not hesitate in imposing trade restrictions for those critical goods. This together with the synchronous and abrupt increase in global demand was a recipe from unprecedented hardship in access in diagnostics, PPEs and other critical health goods. Once the vaccine became available, it was no difference. Mostly the countries that were manufacturing the vaccine hoarded the initial production and high income countries was able to, were able to secure the supply uh, before less wealthy counterpart. It wasn't that bad, but we say we fare similar challenges during 2009 pandemic and even before in every health emergency. So who fares better during emergencies? Those countries with manufacturing capacity, undoubtedly. Then we can recommend that all countries develop manufacturing capacities for all critical health technologies, including vaccines. It probably is not possible or wise to, to, to do so because it's not sustainable. Markets require a certain scale in between emergencies and few countries are large enough to reach the scale within the border. So how do we make this sustainable, not just for emergencies, but between those periods of emergencies? Sustainable industrial development requires strengthening governance mechanism and coordinating coherent, medium and long-term multi-sectoral commitments. Countries must generate adequate environments and ecosystems, which I'm going to emphasize, require the strength and regulatory systems to ensure the quality of the goods that are produced. We need to have institutions dedicated to the promotion of research and promotion of policies. And we need to adopt the trade and intellectual property policies consistent with the objective of industrial development. But for this, in my closing remark, we need to bring countries together. We need to diversify and decentralize value chain. So we are all on this together and we counteract the urge of countries to impose restriction to exports during emergency. If we take a regional approach, we create a sustainable investment, we have the right policies at the regional levels, then pool procurement mechanisms such as the one PAHO has with the revolving fund for vaccines and the uh, strategic fund for medicines could also ensure sustainability for the manufacturers, long-term planning for demand, and ensure that we get access to those commodities at the right price and at the right time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kira, for these uh, very relevant comments. Uh, so, so thank you again. I would just like to, hi to highlight, uh, you made reference to sustainability and affordability. And this was also mentioned by the previous panelists, in particular by Patrick and Akira. So this is very important to ensure that manufacturing capacity is developed, taking into account the need in order to ensure that it is sustainable over time and that is, uh, it is leading to affordable uh, products. Uh, also, thank you for mentioning the policy document that uh, you're about to publish. By the way, the South Center is also working on a document on the economics of um, vaccine production on the, on, the, on the vaccine's market structure that we hope to publish in, uh, in a few weeks that we hope also will contribute to uh, the analysis of the current situation and the future of uh, local manufacturing in this field. So thank you very much, Maria, again. So we move now uh, to uh, our next uh, respondent, Jean-Michel. You there? Okay. So Jean-Michel Pietaniel, uh, he's the director of Southeast Asia for Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, DNDI, since April 2016. And he's also been a member of the International Board of uh, Medicines and Frontier, MSF, from 2013 to 2016. So thank you very much, Jean-Michel, for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I guess I, I was invited if I can have the presentation because we, we of the experience we've had in Southeast Asia, so I'm, I'm in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and we've just developed um, 
Um, is there a present? Is the presentation here, or should I put it up myself? Yes. Sorry. One minute. Okay. So, um, but before then, maybe before we start, I'd like to say that I think the regional solution is key. Yeah? Um, in 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 the sense that for me, in terms of uh, vaccine or or drug development, you need market depth. You know, if you you can see, for example, Thailand, um, our neighbor next door, has the potential to develop vaccines, but they didn't have a lot of um, COVID nineteen cases for a long time, so they were not able to uh, do clinical trial and and develop these vaccines. So I think it's important to to uh, consider. Uh, the the re uh, regional to work with countries uh, in a region in order to be successful. I think there's an economy of scale. I think there's an ability to um, identify you know um, uh, gaps and to fill those gaps together. So um, in uh, in in Malaysia, what we did is we uh, develop. Next, please. We develop a new chemical entity uh, for, uh, for as part of a combination treatment for hepatitis C. Uh, that chemical entity is called Ravidasvir. So, I, 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 three uh, points that I wanted to take away from that experience is uh, first of all the clinical trial. So, we did a clinical trial uh, in Malaysia and in Thailand to for the registration of uh, of this new chemical entity. So, showing the efficacy and the safety of that product. That in itself, the fact that we were able to produce a new chemical entity without a big pharmaceutical company is a success. But I think the, the, the and, and of course for the NDI, which is an organization that developed drugs, that's, that's a big success. But I do not see that personally as the, the biggest success of uh, that partnership. I think the model, the fact that this um, drug was developed with a South-South collaboration. So we're talking about Egypt, we're talking about uh, Malaysia, we're talking about Thailand, we're talking about governments we, uh, and uh, private company and pharmaceutical companies in these three countries. I think it's really interesting to see that, you know, un unexpected to see that we are able to uh, develop uh, a product with, uh, through South-South collaboration. Of course, we, we did use some asset uh, base, if you want, in, in Europe, but um, a lot of the money that was coming to finance that development was coming from Egypt and from Malaysia. So, uh, yes, of course, I think it's not a problem to, to uh, go and um, buy the, the expertise if you don't have it or find it somewhere else, as long as you are, I would say, in charge. So that's the, second, the first point, the clinical trial, really interesting and unique for, for a new chemical entity. The fact that it was done through a South-South collaboration. And finally, the fact that um, the Ministry of Health of Malaysia, we started with a clinical trial, but it turned into an access strategy for um, the Ministry of Health of Malaysia. And the backbone of that strategy was the clinical trial. But as we went along, the clinical trial became less important for the Ministry of Health. You know, there were other aspects such as technology transfer, bringing in fine um, uh, to look at test and treat, simplification, scaling up, all that aspect of an access strategy. And of course, the using, uh, using um, the TRIPS agreement to have access to Sophos Buvir, all that meant um, that it was a real ownership um, from the Ministry of Health of Malaysia, from the government, of the development of that drug. And therefore, there was a strong drive to make sure it was successful. This is why, um, if I, when I reflect a little bit for the purpose of uh, the conversation we are having here, next, I think there are key elements in uh, a successful partnership. And, uh, and it's to ensure that the decision making is really with uh, the endemic countries. And I think if we look at um, um, a lot of the mechanisms that have been put in place around COVID through the lens of the decision making, but also the know how, where is the know how and the expertise base? Where are these two, three elements? And we, if, if they are not in the country concerned by the issue themselves, I think the partnership will fail. For me, it's essential, it's been essential 
in the success of what we have achieved with the Malaysian Ministry of Health, the Malaysian uh, government. Ownership is the, you know, the conclusion of, uh, uh, or, or, or falls directly from, from these three elements, as well as funding, you know, I think there's always uh, that issue that, oh yeah, but they don't have any money in these countries and so on. But I, I think it's wrong. I think especially high middle income country, if they feel it's going to benefit them in a positive way in their development, in creating a value chain. And I think value chain is also an important word. If they feel that this partnership will create um, value chain, there will be a strong ownership, an ability to share the risk. Many times the Ministry of Health has taken decisions that um, supported totally, you know, risk-taking decisions that made the success of this project. And they put a lot of money in it. So have the Egyptian, who have been uh, also uh, implementing an incredible access strategy for Egypt. Next. So I think this is the the you know the the points simply that I wanted to to put here for the sake of the discussion, and I'm sure you know. You know answering question will be uh, more interesting and you see the, the strange coalition that managed to produce a new uh, chemical entity including doctors about borders you know malaysia thailand egypt um, and we did as well as the big pharmaceutical company and i think this is something we are very proud of and we hope to do for other diseases thank you Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Michel, for this presentation on this very interesting case of South-South cooperation, a successful case for South cooperation, which also proves that it is possible to develop a new drug or a new vaccine, if that is the case in a developing country, fully developed in a developing country. And the importance of uh, this partnership, as you mentioned, and the ownership of the project, it's also interesting the comment you, you made about uh, funding, uh, when there is a understanding and understanding that there is a strategic value in developing a project or industry, the funding will, will emerge. So thank you very much for this very positive contribution to our discussion here. So now, uh, well, let me then thank all the panelists uh, for the presentations and uh, also the respondents have been uh, very, very substantive presentations and uh, many uh, takeaways we, we can already identify. Some of them have already been mentioned. So now we are moving to the um, questions and answers. I will look at the questions we have been sent to uh, our to the website. So let me just start by one question that was submitted by Professor Sarnoff. And this probably uh, addressed to uh, Anthony So, if you are available. So Professor Sarnoff asked the question, given the problem that companies are not willing to engage in broad know-how sharing that permits the technology transfer, the second step in your pipeline, and given the te techno-nationalism reflected in government decision not to force such transfers to occur, even if compensated, and health nationalism to contract first or local supply, what can be done to encourage governments to force such transfers and to encourage companies to contract with international distribution bodies, such as COVAX, rather than national governments avoiding vaccine and therapeutics nationalism, which can be overcome by compulsory licensing where the limiting step is know-how transfer. So Anthony, if you can address this important so question. Up with the easy question, I take it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think this is a great question, but obviously central to the challenge we have before us. There are a range of modalities that could, could be tried and that are obviously underway now to see which of these will pan out. Um, on the one hand, there are voluntary, obviously, mechanisms such as you know, CTAP, um, which might provide, like in the model of the medicines patent pool, an opportunity for voluntary licensing. Recognize that particularly for mRNA production, um, that we, one of the reasons why we highlight it in our presentation is that there are quite a number also of, of LMICs that already have a potential, of course, um, facility uh, companies are moving forward with this particular novel platform for vaccine um, production. So it's not as if, you know, it's just in the province of, of course, of Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech that such, of course, uh, technology might exist. 
Um, importantly, though, there is a lot of need also to consider if, in fact, the know-how is to be transferred, that there is a lot of value in having the experience of those in which have preceded to be able to share more openly. This, of course, was the inspiration behind the efforts uh, that I mentioned in the WHO UNICEF uh, project with India over penicillin many, many years ago. And I believe that is still, of course, in some ways, um, the, the key to um, enabling international collaboration will be through these kinds of innovation hubs. Now, how do you compel a company to uh, come to the table? We, have, we don't have the kinds of measures that we probably should have actually put into place in advance of the pandemic uh, to do so. But some of these companies clearly are significantly um, publicly funded, all of them actually, um, in terms of the R&Ds being paid for, for those vaccines that successfully come to the market by public financing, because in fact, we are paying for the results, which include the R&D costs. So the question, of course, is how to then leverage full procurement from the public sector in a way that compels. The other thing is, of course, control over the manufacturing facilities as well. Um, and that will be also an important um, lever if, in fact, much of the sourcing of the scale up will, in fact, turn be in the hands of some of these other facilities. And then finally, of course, there's the important movement over the WTO TRIPS waiver, which would provide um, at least for a period of time, and I think we would need to have regimes that would follow this, uh, that an enablement of access to the building blocks of knowledge to carry out this work. Um, I don't really have any, uh, of course, magical solutions uh, to this challenge, but I hope those that laying out of options and policy levers is helpful. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Anthony, for this reply, and uh, Professor Sarno for this very uh, well elaborated question. So there is another question, um, which is the following. How we can ensure equal access to vaccine and overcome existing challenges for targeted nations by unilateral coercive measures? In particular, considering the fact that humanitarian exemptions are not working, what measures should be adopted to ensure equal access of all refugees to vaccines? So this is also a very important question. As we know, many, many countries are victims of these uh, so-called unilateral coercive measures and which have uh, continued to be applied during this COVID-19 crisis. And these measures have prevented uh, access to, timely access to either vaccines or other health products. And this is a very important issue. Uh, I, I wonder whether Ayoade, you would like to uh, address this important issue. You referred to the need to have a humanitarian approach. And uh, I think this is uh, very relevant in the context of the comment you made in your intervention. Thank you very much, um, Carlos. Absolutely. I think it's a critical question. I mean, we know that there's been talk of the humanitarian buffer um, from COVAX for of about 5% of vaccines, but we also know that there are no vaccines. And this is a critical point. You know, the, the, the I see also that Moga has, has said in the in the chat has talked about, you know, the, 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 the recommendation that we evaluate what went wrong with the distribution of vaccines. I'm very concerned, obviously, as somebody whose previous life was a as a humanitarian coordinator for the um, Nigerian, that, that Lake Chad region, about people who have limited access anyway, places where we have very limited access to, you know, there's limited humanitarian access, those people who fall between the, the cracks. And I think we, we, we have a duty as, as we talk to, you know, some of the audience here today, member states to advocate for, I mean, I, I don't know beyond the, 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 the multilateral um, access to vaccines, we need to begin to advocate for humanitarian agencies to have special access themselves to be able to be to be provided with vaccines. The Medicines Sans Frontières, the ICRCs, I've had detailed conversations with, with colleagues at ICRC, Patrick, uh, particularly with um, for Africa at ICRC about how do we get vaccines to those, you know, IDPs. In Nigeria, we have over 2 million people who are displaced. Um, in, in Nigeria, we have over 22 million who are affected by humanitarian crises. Africa has the most refugees in the world. So, you know, how do we get vaccines to these people? I think it is a, it, it is a brilliant um, question because th these are some of the things, these, and also those who are non-state armed groups as well. 
you know, those who fall between the cracks, how do we negotiate with countries and how do we negotiate with governments to say, say, you know, Al-Shabaab or ISIS, or ISIS West Africa, that those combatants and, and the groups that, and the, the regions that they control have access to vaccines because, you know, the virus does not discriminate between, um, between um, state actors or non-state actors, does not discriminate between IDPs and non-IDPs. I mean, I, the, the fact that we don't have enough to, to deal with our sort of high income regular populations at the moment is, is, is enough of an issue. But then when we talk about the fluidity between borders for refugee populations and, um, and conflict situations, look at the Tigray, for instance, in, in, in Ethiopia right now, who is going to vaccinate those people? Which government is going to take responsibility for, for, for what is needed there? So I think this is where we need the humanitarian organizations at the table. We need the ICRCs, we need the MSFs to come to the table. I mean, I wonder what, what um, Jean-Michel actually thinks about this and, and see how we can ensure equity for those who are the, really the, the, the least served. We can barely get food and water to them. How on earth are we going to get vaccines? Over. Thank you much, Adiade, for this reply and uh, for highlighting the importance of the question made. Certainly, the United question measures represent a major violation to international law and the UN Charter. And the international community should work together in order to uh, lift them in the first place. And as it was mentioned in, in the question itself, the humanitarian, the so-called humanitarian exceptions are too narrow, and they are managed in a way that uh, do not, uh, it's, they are not suitable in order to reach the, the intended objective. So thank you for, for this reply. There is another question that relates to the role of um, public sector procurement. And Akira, you, you did mention the important role that uh, the Brazilian government procurement has had in the development of the uh, vaccines industry in, uh, in Brazil, in addition to the uh, partnership that you also mentioned. So can you elaborate? Can you elaborate on this? Uh, yes. Uh, if you think in sustainable local production, uh, you must have a commitment with, with support of a government to have uh, the sustainability, economical and technologically sustainability for long period. So, uh, of course, uh, the local production must be must be uh, uh, must have a competitiveness. You know, you must compete in price and quality with the product in international market. So therefore, if you, you, you get this uh, you know, high quality product, affordable price, uh, which you compare with the, uh, uh, with the international uh, product, the government, the government will support you. Uh, this is the way we, we, ha we have uh, internalized all the technology uh, using this, uh, 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 the government purchase power, you know, supporting our production. This is the way we we got uh, our capacity. Okay, I don't that? know. I don't know if you understood my my question, my yeah. answer, yeah, my yeah, explanation. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Akira, for that. So it, it's also linked to the point you made. Uh, you made earlier about the, the political will as a major condition in order to promote effectively manufacturing capacity in developing countries. Um, in fact, it's interesting that in, in many developing countries, it was also mentioned by, by Anthony. So is somebody with an open micro? Okay. So uh, the fact is that in many developing countries, uh, currently there are vaccines which are under development or already tested, such as the case of, of Cuba or India. So there is the capacity in, in developing countries to engage in development and production of vaccines. Um, it is often said that this is too complex and this is one excuse that some companies have put in order to deny transfer of technology, but uh, it is under understandable there is complexity it is not as simple as producing some uh, chemical compounds, but it's not impossible. And it has been shown by the case of Brazil, presented today, 
and the case of uh, DNDI development of a new drug, and also by development of a number of, uh, of uh, vaccines. Uh, I, I did mention India, Cuba, I could also add uh, Mexico, Iran, Indonesia, Thailand, and another country. So thank you very much, uh, Akira, for this response. Another, another question is in relation to the role that, um, in particular in the case of PAHO, has had the uh, revolving fund and the PAHO strategic fund for non-vaccine commodities. So Analia, can you please uh, tell us what the role has been or what the future role of these uh, funds could be? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, you know, the fund has uh, uh, many years of operating in the region and has uh, been instrumental in maintaining the access to safe uh, quality vaccines at affordable prices during regular times and for public health immunization, as well as the strategic fund for medicines such as in HIV and, and TV. During the pandemic, we actually uh, put uh, the funds at the at the service again of the of our member states. Actually, I was uh, sent to Geneva so that the the global supply chain consortium will operate and send the goods through the revolving fund through the strategic and revolving funds to the country. And today, the revolving fund for vaccine is also enabling the procurement of our countries through the COVAX facility with all the technical cooperation that goes behind it, which I think it's it's worth saying. It's not just a procurement fund, it's a technical cooperation approach to ensure end-to-end -end safe access to vaccine. So once again, for us, the funds are a guarantee of sustainable, um, of, of the sustainability of this approach and to the equitable access. We operate on a, with a very minimal, um, um, in, you know, charge to countries in order to to make this sustainable, and we ensure that all countries uh, receive the vaccine and and the technical cooperation to to approach it, and we put this at the service of national and. Um, regional manufacturers that are willing to work with us and not just within the country level. And I think this is important to emphasize. Many manufacturers, for example, in the past for Chagas disease um, commodities have mentioned that the fact they can't stay in the market is because the fund enables the pooling of demand. It's one uh, stop shop for manufacturers and for countries. And I think this is a necessary component of any sustainable and long-term deployment of COVID vaccine. So I think we can play a, a key role, not only for the countries, but to manufacturers who want to ensure that the product will reach the target and will uh, enable all of our member states to use it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, response, uh, Analia. I have now a question for um, Patrick. So the question uh, reads as follows. How relevant is to the manufacture of vaccines performing the last step, feel and feeling? Are we really dependent in the manufacturing of the drug substance, the active substance, which is the meaning of independence and the level of death in technology transfer agreements? So if you can uh, address this question, Patrick, and the second question I would like to, uh, to also make to you is uh, in relation to funding. Um, of course, the, the program, the plan by, by the African Union is, is very important. Have you considered already what kind of funding this project could, could have, this long-term project could have, what the role of the development banks, for instance, in Africa could be? Okay, so let me, let me try and answer the the first question around technology transfers and this is there value my interpretation of the question is is there value in uh simply formulating and filling because that embeds a dependence on a on the technology and the drug substance coming from a third party supplier the way we'd like to position this is that this is not an all or nothing approach. That one has to come up with a, a structured plan, 
um, that engages all stakeholders in the capacity capability building exercise, whether it's at the local company in one country or regionally. And so to use an example from BioVac, the company at which I work, uh, we have used what we have come to term a, a reverse integration strategy, a backward integration strategy. And what this simply means is to look at the value chain from start to finish and build the capability from the end going upstream. Now, why is that important? Uh, it's important for a number of reasons. One is that you don't have to spend a big chunk of money all at once. Second, your, you can sequence the efforts and the investments required of time and effort with respect to building the skills and the quality management systems and, and the whole ecosystem locally at the, uh, at the company. And uh, secondly, uh, it is uh, in bite-sized chunks. So you can, you can digest that, but with the aim of having the full value chain embedded over a period of time. The additional um, advantage of that approach has is if you start from the beginning and then you say, I'll take step one. When you get to the end of step one, you run up against the fact that you're not ready for step two. So, so you're always chasing the, uh, the tension in, in, the, in the capacity. Whereas if you build from the back upstream, you're always um, guaranteed that you're ready for the next step. So those are some of the advantages uh, in terms of the backward integration strategy. But I think that the technology transfer, it becomes important in terms of capacity building, the accelerated capacity building, but it can't stop there. It should be with an end in mind that ultimately it's going to be the full value chain uh, manufacturing. I hope that answers the question. Okay, so very much. Um, the second question, Carlos, uh, around funding, I think it's a, it's a simple answer, and that is it's going to take all sorts of funding to make this thing happen. It's going to take some equity investment. It's going to take some development finance uh, funding coming in. It's going, to, it's going to take governments putting some money on the table. Um, um, and, and, and I think it's going to, we're going to see a mix of this, uh, mix of this happening. The, the sums of money are not insignificant. Um, as an example, to put up a facility that uh, might produce uh, 100 million doses of, uh, full, on a full finish basis could cost you in the order of $100 million. Uh, um, and you need to have a, a confidence in the investment case behind that uh, uh, investment of $100 million before spending a dollar. And this ties in with some of the points that Akira has raised about sustainability, guaranteed access to markets, commitment from governments, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is what we mean when we talk about the whole um, uh, um, uh, ecosystem being uh, enabled. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, certainly, that's a major issue that needs to be addressed in order to ensure that uh, the outcome is uh, achieved. Um, so we are now close to the uh, end of this uh, event. Um, I would like to ask the, uh, each of the panelists just to take two minutes in order to address the a very last but very important question. The question reads, how to ensure universalism to ensure that all get vaccines to the entire population rather than the vulnerable groups only? And there is also reference to the need for vaccination of children and young population. So uh, how then local manufacturing can contribute to reach this objective of ensuring universalism in getting vaccines to all. So if, we, if you can just uh, make a brief comment, uh, starting with uh, Anthony.
Well, in order to actually, of course, achieve universalism, we need to find some way of relaxing the constraint on the supply so that actually more closely approximates the demand. And that will, of course, require the conditions that we've been discussing about scaling up uh, local production. And I think that obviously we need to take more of a systems perspective to do that. And you know, as we were discussing a little bit earlier about, of course, how to in, um, create the incentives so that actually the players collaborate, this will require rethinking how um, that system is built. So we need to think about how we're going to re-engineer the pharmaceutical value chain in a way that will enable us to, in fact, scale to that level and more importantly, park the resources for delivering future um, products, particularly for pandemics, in a way that actually is closer to those in need so that there'll be greater control over the supply and the queuing of these products so that um, we can more fairly distribute um, appropriately across the world in this kind of setting. Um, I think that means planking and so the way local production with other considerations as well, such as, for example, pool procurement and also R&D capacity. I hope that's a helpful start to discussion here. Yeah, very good. Two, two very important and sharp co uh, concepts, uh, Anthony. Thank you very much. Are you adding your own? Oh, thank you. Reviews? Thank you. Again, Anthony has, has really hit the nail on the head. I would like to add to what he said. I mean, that question really goes to, the, to what we're all talking about at the moment, which is vaccine equity. And what you know, some of us are describing is what is going on right now in the low, low middle income countries of the world, Africa and other parts of the world, is not just vaccine inequity, it's actually beginning to border upon vaccine apartheid. And what is behind that is what we need to fix. And what is behind that is the power structure, the power imbalance and the decision-making imbalance that exists. And I know a few of my colleagues have referenced decision-making um, earlier. I think um, my, my colleague from, from South America, I think mentioned, mentioned uh, Maria mentioned a little bit about decision-making earlier. So what we need you know, is yes, we can have technical discussions about how we produce vaccines. We can talk about the value chain. What um, Patrick just spoke about really um, eloquently uh, with the last question in terms of backward integration strategy, that is all very well and fine. But if we don't address the power imbalance, if we don't remove these, these, these waivers, I mean, we, we, we don't remove these barriers for developed low income countries and developing countries to begin to produce their own vaccines, then we're not going to remove the equity issues. And in that we need, if that also goes to one of the other questions in the chat, which talks about, you know, how, how would you reform, if you like, the act accelerate or COVAX? And that is by greater inclusion, making sure that there is more voice from Latin America, there is more voice from Africa, there is more voice from Asia within these power making structures, not just the, not, not, not just the, the um, as window dressing, you know, the, the one where you invite somebody there because you need one brown person, one black person, and one woman. No, you give them equal voice and you give them equal um, decision-making power at the table. So, so what we need here is decision-making equity, power equity, as well as vaccine equity. Without that, this, that, this, this virus is not going away. I mean, we're we also need to be talking post-COVID. But now we have a Delta variant that is going to a Lambda variant, and we need to act now to ensure that we fix these systems um, for the future. So thank you very much um, to all. Thanks for having me. Ajoade, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick, would like to add a very brief comment? Yes, I, I, there's little, very little space to add uh, to, to what has been said already. I think all the key issues have been covered. And we're in a very technical hat because that's where, where my uh, expertise and experience comes from. I think that uh, what has been said is local production, R&D is important. And I think that we need to examine how procurement takes place. Um, and I think this, this, is, this has been flagged, but uh, if we looked at how COVAX has failed miserably, I think there should also be perhaps an element, and this is not my area of expertise, but perhaps an element of, like we're talking about regional production, should we also be talking about regional markets and regional procurement uh, happening like Pao? Pao is a splendid example of that. And, and, and I think that that is part of the power dynamic, which was referred to earlier. Uh, and and, and it's, we have to find mechanisms, even if it's small, but but we chisel away at breaking this power dynamic 
which is uh, embedded in the current architecture of the way things uh, things operate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick, for, for this comment. It's very important. You mentioned that the regional procurement, you also need to create the to ensure the demand if you are, wish to develop the local production. Uh, Dr. Homa, Akira, I would like to make a very short comment. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, just remember that uh, this is uh, to, to have a, uh, uh, to reach this uh, uh, universal vaccination, we need to have a, a better offer of vaccine. And just, of course, local production is important, but just remember, we are now getting more new vaccine licenses. And also uh, the uh, big, big pharma is also producing much more vaccine. I hope that uh, in few months we will have a much more vaccine and then it will be important to have a solidarity, equity of access and solidarity to have a, a possibility to, to offer all uh, the vaccine for everybody. And it is important to have vaccine to everybody, to entire world population in order to have the control of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I hope we will have this chance, you know, uh, for mm -hmm. for end of this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akira, for this. I certainly fully agree with you, Analia. Just a very brief comment. Yes, yeah, thank you. I'm not going to repeat what all others said because I think it needs to be done. Uh, but I think the, the footnote is we cannot keep doing things business as usual. Something needs to change in the post-COVID agenda. We need to rethink the order and the benefits. Uh, it is about solidarity, it's about coherence, but honestly, it's even about economic sense. This, you know, this, this pandemic has shows that we are all in this together, really. Uh, even if you vaccinate uh, your country, but your neighbors are, are not vaccinated, you're not gonna get out of this when a new variants will emerge. So I, I think there has to be a rethinking of, of, of how access to critical technologies, especially vaccines, it's, it's dealt with at the global level. And we need to have, as Yodi said, one voice uh, and not just the, the voice of, of, of the, you know, the, the, the powerful. But having said that, we need to be coherent in the long term and countries need to commit to this for the long run because this is not, not gonna happen overnight. Thank you. Okay, thank you much. So long-term commitment, a new paradigm, and a stronger voice for developing countries. Jean-Michel, your very last final comments. Well, I'd like to, first of all, this is more my personal comments than my organization. And to answer to Ayodhya, I think, you know, I'd like to promote access through R&D. This is quite innovative to think of access through research and development rather than sitting around the table to negotiate. We, have, we know that doesn't work. We know the model is, uh, does not want necessarily to see new players. Uh, yeah. The the whole the health, uh, global health infrastructure, infrastructure is geared up towards you know, um, uh, charity maybe rather than uh, sustainability. So, and, and that access through R&D, I would advocate strongly that it happens through South South collaboration. Carlos was mentioning there are vaccines, you know, there are many vaccines being developed. You know, in, in Malaysia, when we started doing this, developing this new uh, treatment, and then when it's, it became a kind of a threat, if I can use that word, and we saw the price of, of going down, you know, and now in Malaysia, you can, you can have a 12 weeks uh, treatment for HCV from less than 130 US dollar to around 350, you got access to three treatments. And that only happened because there was a pressure, a market, competitive market pressure through a South-South collaboration. And I think this has to be replicated. We need new model. We cannot be stuck where we are. It's not delivering as we can see. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Michel. Well, thanks uh, to all for, uh, in fact, you have made my, my own job by summarizing very well a lot of discussion that has taken place. 
So just in a few words, uh, social cooperation is key in order to move forward and, and ensure that local production is expanded. Relaxing uh, the constraints of supply, as uh, Anthony has said, is key. Also engineering the value chain and ensure that, that the demand is also managed in such a way that sustainability and affordability are there if uh, local manufacturing production is, is expanded. So all these factors need to be taken into account. The supply side, the demand side, we need to look at both of them in the context of uh, stronger South South cooperation, a stronger voice for developing countries, you know, to, to ensure universal access to vaccines and other health products, because it's not just vaccines, it may be uh, treatments too, or, or diagnostic kits or equipment, which is, which is needed. So thank you very much, very much again to our panelists and respondents for uh, participating in this, in this meeting. If you can just put on your, your cameras, so we are able to make a, a screenshot. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank you to the participants also for joining us. Uh, Anthony for uh, willing to organize this meeting with uh, the South Center. We are very proud of the cooperation with REACT and your hope is university and hope this will certainly continue. So thank you very much to all. And uh, we, are, we have had really a very substantive uh, event, uh, a lot of takeaways. And so let, let's see whether we can meet uh, soon, uh, virtually or in person and continue this dialogue. And uh, of course we are, we are waiting for uh, Africa really to move forward in this new and fantastic program they have put in place. So thank you very much to all and uh, have a nice uh, afternoon, evening uh, to all. Bye-bye.